My name is Andrew McGowan. I'm a musician and athlete who geeks out on fashion, art, and great food. I spent time working with elite performers, repairing instruments for major symphony musicians, training for marathons, and designing wardrobes from everyone from freshman college students to big city lawyers. Trequartista is the Italian word for playmaker and is used to describe a particularly creative role on the soccer pitch, typically behind the central striker. And as the musical Trequartista, I aim to kickstart conversations about topics and areas that I think are underrated, underdiscussed, or particularly important to a sustainable high octane life. This is the Musical Trek Artista, the podcast. Good morning, everyone. This is the first podcast from the new couch, and it's it's really, really exciting uh, to be doing this. So uh, today, what I wanted to talk about is the importance of doing or having something that you do outside of your career that reinforces to you that how important it is uh, to keep the mindset of a beginner always. It's really beautiful when, uh, if you've started a lot of new things, being able to keep that mindset and that joy of making tiny, tiny improvements, because in the early stages, even the tiniest improvement feels so huge. I talk a lot whenever I want to get esoteric with people about how time is logarithmic, and what that means is, like, as we experience time going forward, it feels like it's getting faster because we've experienced more time. So, like, when you're two, a year feels like forever because it's half of your life, Versus when you're 16, a year feels a lot shorter because it's a 16th of your life. And when you're 50, a year feels even shorter because it's a 50th of your life. And so as a result of that perspective, um, time feels like it's getting faster, even though it's an arbitrary unit of measurement. We've decided to measure the movement of the universe. But um, being a beginner is the same way. We want to have that same... It, it, it's so easy to lose track of uh, tiny improvements and how those really, really stack into major improvements. I had the benefit of hearing Chris Olka talk about this at the Eastman Tube Academy this year, where he said that uh, the power of tiny wins and making sure you're winning every day in order to instill winning mentality is the way to really create success in the long term. And so... Why is it important to have something you do outside of, like, the art that you make or the job that you have? And what does that look like? Well, it's really anything where you can remind yourself, I'm a beginner, I need to improve. And what it allows you to do is have perspective about the thing that you are best at. So, for example, one of the things that I like to do is go run. And a lot of people know that I like to run. I'm training for a marathon right now. Uh, uh, Last year, I ran 22 half marathons in 22 weeks, which was gnarly. Um, But one of the things that reminds me, especially when I see other runners and other much better marathon runners, is that, like, yeah, I'm not the best marathon runner. And I probably will never be. I'm definitely never going to be Courtney DeWalter or Zach Bitter or Des Linden, or any of the amazing runners out there. But what I can do is improve myself. And it's helpful for me because as someone who is a very spatial kinesthetic learner, uh, it really helps me to move, to think. And doing that much cardio helps me shut off the inner dialogue sometimes, which can be really helpful. But one thing it does do is remind me that when I shave, like, 10 seconds off my mile pace, which is, especially over a a race that long, is a rapid improvement, even though it doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, When I go back to doing the music thing, and I see, oh, I've, I sold a piece for a change, or I won a competition, or um, I've gained another student, or I've booked another masterclass, or... I've placed a little better in ensembles, or I can play this, I can play festival variations four clicks faster today. 
makes it easier to appreciate those things. Because if you can have the experience of what it's like not being in the 1% of 1% in your field, then it helps you appreciate what it's like to be the 1% of the 1% of your field. And more importantly, it helps you not judge yourself so much. Too many folks spend all of their time thinking, my art is what I do, or my job is what I do. But if you have things outside of that, not only does that make you a more interdisciplinary and well-rounded person, which is important and great and necessary, but it also uh, allows you to be more objective about the kinds of things that you do which is really, really important. And when we have objectivity about the things that we do, specifically like our art or our work, then it makes it much more accessible for us to make improvements and be real with ourselves about what's going on. And when we're not holding that against ourselves emotionally, we're able to... Uh, have a more uh, holistic and uh, wholesome relationship with our work, which is really, really important. There's too many folks in the U.S. who spend all of their time working and then retire and then have no sense of self or sense of identity. And that's why it's so important to have things that you do that aren't work. Not only so you can be better at your job, because there's loads of neuroscience that backs that up, but it also uh, allows you to develop your individuality. If I went around telling everybody I was a teacher, but I wasn't doing any teaching, uh, I'm a liar. (laughs) And, or, uh, or I've, um, maybe I've recently retired, and... That's still how I identify. And now I have some beef with that because I don't think people should be defined by their jobs. Because a job is just a title. It is just a thing that says, like, the kind of thing that you do. Um, I think folks should approach themselves as, what kind of human being are they? Um, Are you a parent? Are you a board game enthusiast? Uh, Are you an athlete? Those... None of that has anything to do with your work, but can tell somebody a lot about you. Are you an artist? Uh, My friend Tara is an amazing painter, and I don't know that she would necessarily call herself an artist. She would definitely say she's a teacher, but but that's what she does for a living. Um, But to me, that's not very interesting. I want to know the person behind whatever it is that you do. And I think that... In pursuit of those kinds of endeavors, it actually allows us to uh, develop our work better. Because again, our sense of self-worth doesn't come from how good we are at our job. And that, again, is something that requires a significant amount of perspective. Because how good we are at our job, in most cases, the feedback comes from us, not from other people. How weird would it be if your boss came up to you every day and said, you're so great at your job? I mean, it would feel amazing. And there's probably an argument that uh, more supervisors could afford to do things like that. But that's not going to happen. Supervisors don't do that, especially in the U.S. And so one of the things that we got to think about is how can we instill our own sense of self-worth? And it's going to be different for everybody. So, for me, it's making sure I have time outside of work to just relax, watch Star Wars, play some board games, hang with friends, you know, regular things. Um, But also making sure that, like, uh, because it's so available to my personality to have a need to create things, making sure I'm creating something regularly, whether it's this podcast or, more importantly, writing music is huge for me because I have a chronic need to pull art from the fabric of the universe. And so when uh, I'm just playing tuber euphonium, it doesn't always, it doesn't always scratch that itch. And I love 
playing tuba and euphonium, and I love curating music on tuba and euphonium, especially when I get to collaborate with living composers. But it's not the same. And so figuring out that that's a need I have and figuring out how to scratch both and tie both into my career so that everything about my career is wholesome and scratches the itches that I have is really, really important. And I had a, a wacky um, come-to-Jesus moment earlier this year where I realized as much as I love to read, I don't think I like reading as much as I've told myself I do. And I love having access to other people's ideas through things like books. But I'm trying to do so many things that if I had to give something up, I'd give up reading for audiobooks in a heartbeat. <laughs> because it's just a bit easier. Uh, and I think part of that is just the chronic lack of time in the day that I have. The The greatest gift I think I could be given is an extra five hours in the day that nobody could assign for anything. And honestly, I think everybody could afford that. Just five hours to sleep and do nothing would help a lot of people. Uh, and, well, and... To go back to the importance of being an eternal beginner, uh, I have an anecdote to share. Earlier this year, I actually last year, um, I strained my hamstring. This was about three weeks after my 22 half marathons in 22 weeks. And I went to physical therapy for the first time. And it was really wacky because over my time there, I had to come to terms with the fact that I lacked a lot of mobility and a lot of the stretching pedagogy that I had received throughout my entire life was pretty objectively terrible and in a lot of cases, flatly incorrect. And so it was cool to go and work with an expert and sit down and figure out like, okay, what do I need to work on? What are the areas that really need some work? And that's when I found out that not only do I carry a boatload of tightness in my lower back, um, and I'm incredibly hamstring dominant, as many male runners are, so uh, I really needed to develop my glutes and uh, flexibility in my hips. And I got probably an hour and a half's worth of exercises every day to work on those. And I did them every day and twice on Sundays, literally. And uh, I remember going into physical therapy, and uh, my therapist looked at me and said, Okay, Andrew, how did exercises go this week? And I said, You know, they went really great. They were incredibly humbling to realize, like, the underdeveloped uh, strength in my hips and glutes that I have. And I found them incredibly challenging, but I did them every day and twice on Sundays. And... And she laughed <laughs> and said, no, seriously, how did they go? And I said, no, that's how they went. She said, you you really did your stretches every day and twice on Sundays? And I said, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I came here wanting to figure out how to get better, and this is, uh, this is, what, uh, this is the work I'm going to do. And that's when she told me that most of the people that go to their PT clinic don't do any of their stretches. <laughs> uh, and this just kind of highlights that point that showing up really is – 80% of things. I know a lot of people who like to make commitments and cancel at the last minute, and that drives me up the wall. And so, um, in terms of being relentless about our pursuit of quality, yeah, I mean, showing up is a lot of it, especially if you've built a baseline of skill that dictates so much uh, of what you have to do may not need preparation. And so... That's that's difficult to wrap our brains around because, especially for musicians, the major the the primary listener to what we do is us, and so what we think needs a dramatic amount of preparation may not to a lot of listeners, which is a wacky thing to think about and something I still am trying to come to terms with because I'm one of those people who wants to deliver eleven out of ten on everything. And is, is that possible? Uh, and especially now that I'm in graduate school and I'm preparing so much music, it's redonkulous. 
and I'm trying to do four recitals in four semesters, I can tell you right now, no, it's impossible to do 11 out of 10 on everything. But what it is possible to do is uh, maybe for me do 8.5 to 9 out of 10 on everything. And by sheer exposure to music, develop rapidly as a musician. One of the interesting things this semester is uh, my teacher is having me play in, uh, he's having me play tuba in the third band in addition to playing principal euphonium in the top band. And that's fascinating for me because in the audition process, not only did I take two auditions in 15 minutes, which was horrifying, but um, I prepped 13 excerpts in five weeks which is a lot of music, especially as somebody who's never prepped orchestral excerpts on tuba before, having to prep their Meister Singer and Prokofiev V and uh, Hungarian March and an etude on tuba for an audition in that short amount of time, it really led to a super, super intense preparation cycle. And I think it actually like warped my perception of the amount of practicing that I need to do for the semester. Because obviously for auditions, we want to make things as clean as possible because you want to show up and deliver. And I don't think that it's bad to have a standard set that high. I think it's very, very good. The thing I would say is, where's the time and place? And that's something that I think people should think about, is what's the time and place for this? You know, Professor Oak says, there's time and place for everything. So, when are we going to use that? And so, to tie this all back together, to tie this all back together, uh, it's so important to have things that you do Specifically, like, things that you can improve at that are outside of your job or your art that allow you to understand what it is like to be a beginner and to appreciate what tiny wins are like. And whether that's doing the workout thing, which is a very accessible way to do that because in a lot of cases you can see improvements visually, which is really helpful, or maybe something else. Um, maybe take a painting or drawing. And for folks who are saying, you know, Andrew, I don't have that kind of time. I know what that's like. When I was working in D.C., I worked probably 65 to 80 hours a week most of the time. And I had a two-hour commute each way to work, and I hated it. And, yeah, it got really difficult, but... I made time to run every single morning and do pull-ups every single morning. And I went from, as I talked about in the training and volume episode, I went from being able to do five pull-ups a day to 60 pull-ups a day in three months. That's a lot of tiny wins. It can happen. And you can do that while prioritizing your rest. It's deciding what things are important to you. You know, do you, and I'm I'm not saying that like you shouldn't play video games or watch movies or whatever. Or I I watch tons of Netflix, so like I, I'm hardly one to talk. But in the grand scheme of things, is it better for you to have perspective, or and 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 I want to be clear about this. Pers- like the thing you do outside of work should be something that helps you unwind. It shouldn't wind you tighter. The idea is to have an activity that you pursue leisurely that helps remind you that you are good at your job. Because even though it would be amazing for somebody to tell you that a lot, nobody's going to. Because they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about them. And that's fine. But you got to take care of you, fam. Alrighty, that's it for this week. Thanks so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Musical Trick Artista, the podcast. You can find us online at mcgowanmusic.com or listen on your favorite podcast platform. You can also visit us at Andrew McGowan on YouTube or Music McGowan on Instagram.